Well, this is the second webinar of the series um, Supporting Pollinators and Beneficial Insects in Backyards and on Farms in Northern New Mexico specifically. And this is a, a joint project of the Xerces Society and New Mexico State University. And this webinar is about the helpful bugs of Northern New Mexico how to identify and conserve beneficial insects for pest control. And we have two speakers today. Our first speaker is Emily May, and she is a pollinator conservation specialist with the Circe Society. Emily is uh, with the Pesticide Program in the Circe Society for Invertebrate Conservation, and she received a master's in entomology from Michigan State University and has studied habitat restoration, bee nesting habits, and the effects of pest management practices on wild bee communities. Her work with Xerce since 2015 has focused on supporting pollinators and beneficial insects through habitat creation and mitigating pesticide risk to bees and other beneficial insects. So welcome, Emily. And our second speaker is Miranda Kirsten. She is the Senior Program Specialist at New Mexico State University's Los Lunas Agricultural Science Center. She received her master's in integrative biology from Oklahoma State University, where she studied the effects of land management practices on a milkweed dependent moth and its parasitoids. She has worked in invasive species removal and riparian restoration in New Mexico. And she has worked with New Mexico State University since 2018, focusing on pollinator integrative pest management, monitoring beneficial insects across urban landscapes and managing IPM research projects. So welcome Miranda and I'll let Emily get started. All right, thanks, Caitlin. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we have the chat disabled because um, it can be a little distracting, but we have the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. So if you have any comments or questions throughout the webinar, feel free to put those into the Q&A and one of us will answer them either during the presentation or after. This is gonna run um, just over an hour between the two of us and then we'll have lots of times for questions at the end. Um, the other thing to note is that we do have live captioning available for this webinar. So if you would find that helpful at, go, at the bottom of your screen, if you have the three little dots that say more, you can click on that and say show subtitles. Or if you don't find it helpful, you can say hide subtitles. Um, this is gonna be recorded and will be available on YouTube. Um, we'll send out the raw video recording right away. So if there's anything that you feel like you missed during the course of today's presentation, you can immediately watch it, but then we'll have the sort of edited video file up on YouTube in a week or two. So with that, I'll get started. Let's see here. So just to, just to start off, I'd like to thank our partners at New Mexico State. This uh, work is supported by a grant from the Crop Protection and Pest Management Program of USDA's uh, National Institute of Food, of Food and Agriculture. I'd also like to thank the Carol Petrie Foundation which funds our work in the Southwest. And finally, also to Xerces Society members, we're a member supported nonprofit, and I'd like to give a special thanks to Xerces Society members who make our work possible. If you're not familiar with Xerces, I'm not gonna give a huge introduction. You're welcome to listen to Caitlin's presentation from last week's webinar, but we have been working since 1971 to protect wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitats. Our main office is in Portland, and then we have regional staff around the country uh, working on pollinators and agricultural biodiversity, on endangered species and aquatic invertebrates, um, among other things. So check us out. But so why are we here? Um, insects and other invertebrates or animals that don't have a backbone represent the vast majority of described animal species on the planet. They're also the vast majority of animal biomass, um, but an increasing number of studies are showing 
declines in insect populations. You probably saw some headlines in the last year or so about the insect apocalypse. Um, and while it may not be as devastating as, as some of those headlines would say, um, there's definitely been ma massive declines, especially among flying insects. So the International Union for Conservation of Nature, or the IUCN, uh, is an authority that assesses species extinction risk, risk and threats to different species. Um, and although they've looked at less than 1% of described invertebrate species, uh, about 40% of the species that they have assessed are considered threatened. On a personal level, this might feel familiar to you. Anecdotally, a lot of the people that I've talked to have the feeling like they're spending less time scraping bugs off the front of their cars, off their windshields and their radiators than they might have done back in the 70s or 80s. This kind of gut feeling actually has a name. It's called the windshield effect. And of course, it's anecdotal but there are a few studies that have actually surveyed car windshields. There's one from Denmark that found an 80% decline in the abundance on car windscreens over a 10 year period from the 90s through the 2000s. And then another in the UK um, used a sort of grid placed over the front plate on the car called a splatometer, which found 50% fewer impacts in 2019 than in 2004. Now, some people would argue that vintage cars were less aerodynamic and that's why they're hitting more bugs. But actually that second study specifically included cars that were up to 70 years old and actually found that modern cars hit slightly more insects over the course of their study. These windshield surveys mirror the patterns of decline that have been reported pretty widely elsewhere in the literature. The most well-documented long-term study of insect biomass was a, over a large region is a nearly 30-year study in nature reserves in Germany, which found that total flying insect biomass declined by over 70 percent from the course of 1986 to 2016 across 63 different study locations. A review of occurrence records, so like 90 million different records for four insect orders covering beetles, bees, wasps, and ants, moth and butterflies and dragonflies found declines of 30 to 60 percent in frequency of occurrence over the last four decades and similar rates of decline have been reported in different studies for specific insect groups like dung beetles, tree crickets, and bumblebees. So the picture isn't going to be the same for every kind of insect, um, but there are a lot of insect orders and within that insect families that are showing uh, symptoms of decline. So what's driving insect declines? In order to be able to sort of protect and conserve insects, we have to know what's causing them to decline in number. Many insect species groups that are experiencing high rates of extinction risk, like flying insects, like beetles and bees and butterflies, uh, for those groups, habitat change is the most widespread reporting mechanism, followed by pollution. So that's mainly uh, agricultural and urban use of pesticides biological factors, which is mainly pathogens and introduced species, and then climate change. And this, this figure is from a survey of the worldwide decline of insects and review of drivers looking across many different studies. One of the things this review found is that Europe and North America are very overrepresented in studies of insect declines by taxa. Almost nothing has been published for tropical regions, and we know relatively little about patterns in those regions. Climate change and increasing temperatures might be a bigger driver in tropical regions than in temperate regions. There is a study from Puerto Rico from uh, 2018 that found very large declines in arthropod biomass in 2012 relative to the 1970s as well as declines in abundance of lizards and frogs and birds alongside big changes in arthropod biomass. The authors suggested that increased temperatures might be one reason for these declines, along with changes in forest structure that occurred from a series of hurricanes in the 90s and 2000s. So it's really challenging to track insects across large regions and across very long time scales. Insects fluctuate a lot from year to year, but we have a lot more to learn about what's really happening globally. Um, but in any case, there are, there are enough reasons to be concerned wherever you might be living. 
let's talk more about the importance of insects or the little things that run the world. So only a tiny fraction of insects or about 2% of described species have the potential to become pests. Whether they're called that for causing damage to crops or other plants, for transmitting disease, or for simply living in our houses. The vast majority of insects are actually beneficial to humans or they're important for food webs and natural systems. The fate of the world's insects is inseparable from our own fate and from the fate of other wildlife. Insects provide essential services that contribute to soil health, pest control, pollination of crops and other plants, and then they, they form the base of food webs. So in Looking at um, soil health, in prairie soil, there's an estimated 5,000 insect species, or 5,000 insects per square meter. Um, that's, they are recycling nutrients throughout that ecosystem. So this photo on the left is of an ant, and ants are among the more abundant arthropods in many different soils. And they're really important soil engineers alongside plant roots and worms. A study in Massachusetts found that ants moved about 30 tons of soil per acre per year. So they're doing this really important cycling and bioturbation in the soil. Invertebrates are also important for decomposing the vast majority of human and animal waste. What we're going to talk a lot about today is pest control. And so insects are very important for keeping uh, populations of other insects in check. Besides control of insect pests, they're also important for weed control. So seed feeding beetles, for example, are big time weed seed eaters. They eat hundreds of seeds per week of plants like ragweed and pigweed and foxtail, among others. Invertebrates form the base of the animal food web, turning plants into food for other animals. Doug Tallamy, who's the author of the great book, Bringing Nature Home, estimates that a pair of chickadee needs about 10,000 caterpillars over, four, over three weeks to fledge their nest, which is about 450 caterpillars a day. They're also, insects are very important for plant reproduction. We talked last week about the importance of pollinators and some of the different kinds of pollinators found in New Mexico. So if you're more interested in that subject, I'd recommend going back and checking out that webinar when it's available on YouTube. But today we're talking a lot about that pest control service. So let's talk about some terms. I'm kind of introducing a lot of terms so that Miranda can talk in more detail about different groups of insects. But biological control is the first. Biological control is the use of living organisms for controlling unwanted species. And there are three sort of main approaches to biological control for pest management. So let's talk about some of the definitions. Classical or introduced biological control is basically the introduction of a natural enemy into an area to help suppress an introduced pest. So the theory behind this is the natural enemy release hypothesis where some kind of um, introduced species increases in abundance because its community of natural predators aren't present in that introduced range. So there's a couple of examples where this has been very successful and also several where the introduction of a natural enemy uh, for an introduced pest has been pretty disastrous, usually because the introduced natural enemy feeds on more than just the target species. So that's the first kind. The second kind is augmentative biocontrol, which is the use of natural enemies more like a pesticide application where you release a large number of mass reared insects like lady beetles or praying mantises to provide pest suppression for a short period of time. And then the third is conservation biological control, which is relying on su and supporting the populations of wild living natural enemies around you by incorporating practices that help create a favorable environment for them to thrive and survive, like maintaining a diverse plant environment with plants that provide quality pollen and nectar. So I'll talk a little bit more about each of these kinds but really we're focusing on the last one for the rest of um, our conservation section. So again, classical biological control. This is the idea of releasing and establishing a non-native natural enemy um, that occurs in a pest, an introduced pest native range. This is typically managed by government agencies um, for the purpose of long-term pest production. 
So for example, up here in the Northeast, we've uh, released beetles that feed on purple loosestrife, which is a plant species that's made its way into a lot of riparian zones. Um, and those beetles feed exclusively on that plant and help keep it from um, getting out of control. But when you bring in an introduced species, uh, it can have unintended consequences. Um, so the process now involves pretty extensive host range taste testing and ecological risk assessment because of some examples of, um, of things gone wrong in the past. Uh, again, augmentative biocontrol. This is the purchase and release of mass reared insects at, as a temporary measure. The goal isn't establishing a population for long-term suppression. It's really for short-term suppression. And I would say it's, it's the most useful in confined spaces, areas where these insects aren't getting out into, um, into natural spaces. Because one thing you'll learn if you ever do this is that predatory insects generally don't stay in your garden after you release them. They pretty much immediately disperse out into the environment and don't become established. So it's not, it's not a long-term management solution. So conservation biological control is really the system that we're aiming for, which is more of a holistic approach to conserving beneficial insects around you um, and supporting them to help keep pest insects in check by providing your natural enemies with diverse habitat. Practices that support beneficial insects, increase diversity, support natural systems, and reduce reliance on pesticides as an input. Sometimes what this means actually is just tolerating a certain level of an insect that we might see as a pest because having that pest around at a certain level actually brings balance to the system. So lady beetles, you have a lady beetle pictured here. They can consume their weight in aphids as a larva and then continue preying on aphids as adults in order to fuel their egg laying. Um, so a single adult female lady beetle can consume as many as 50 aphids a day. So if we spray a pesticide that kills the aphid, we're also killing the lady beetle in the same breath, but if we tolerate some level of aphids, not only are we not using a pesticide that kills the lady beetles directly, we're actually conserving their food source, which in turn helps the aphids from reaching, um, helps keep the aphids from reaching damaging levels. So practicing conservation biocontrol is about accepting some level of complexity. And just because of uh, something that you might consider a pest is present, it doesn't mean that it's out of control. Looking um, across the US, wild pest control provided by beneficial insects is incredibly important for our farming systems. Um, this is a now pretty out of date estimate of how much they contribute to, to US crops and around the world, but it's the best one we have, which looked at the estimated value by wild beneficial insects and put it at several billion dollars annually for the US and hundreds of billions uh, or uh, over a hundred billion worldwide. Sometimes the insects providing that pest control aren't very visible. So this is a minute little parasitoid wasp um, that's attacking this mottled tortoise beetle. So we have to be paying very close attention to be seeing these patterns around us and seeing these processes and services that insects are providing us. Beneficial insects look uh, very diverse in form. There's lots of different kinds of insects that help keep other insects in check and contribute to pest control. Many of these are contributing to pest control both as a larva and as an adult, including lady beetles and ground beetles and predatory stink bugs. Others may only be eating soft-bodied insects at one life stage or another. And Miranda's gonna talk in far more detail at the sort of life stage level. Um, but for example, lacewings, so down in the bottom left is a lacewing larva, and those larvae may develop, devour hundreds of aphids during their larval stage, and then primarily feed on nectar, pollen, and honeydew as an adult. So we kind of have to know what's going on at every different stage of their life in order to be able to know how to best conserve them. Different insects might control, contribute in using different strategies. And I thought, again, it might be helpful to start off by defining terms. So I've used the word insect a lot already, but I didn't define it. So not all invertebrates are insects. I'm not gonna go too deep into it, but um, the easiest way to tell an insect 
uh, apart from other invertebrates is that it generally has three body parts, so a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, and six legs. It's a little bit more complicated than that, um, but not by much. So we have beneficial insects that we're gonna talk about, including predators and parasitoids. We'll talk about those terms on the next slide. Some of those are also pollinators, including flies and wasps and beetles. And then we also have other invertebrates that contribute to pest control that aren't technically insects, like spiders and harvestmen, centipedes and mites, et cetera. So if it has more than six legs, it's not an insect. So of the different strategies, um, predators are those that capture and consume prey. So this is called predation. Predatory insects are often generalists, meaning they feed on a variety of prey. In general, they tend to be larger than their prey, and will, or they may overwhelm them by attacking in large numbers. So examples of predatory insects include dragonflies, damselflies, lacewings. This is again that lacewing larva up on the top left. Praying mantises, brown beetles, and a lot more. Um, Predators generally kill to feed themselves, but then in some cases, they're also hunting prey for their offspring, <coughs> like predatory wasps. So I said the adult lady beetle consumes um, many, many aphids. This lacewing larva could consume upwards of 400 aphids a week. So they're giving a run for their money. The diversity of these kinds of predatory insects um, and other predatory non-insects like spiders can be really high on farms and in gardens. So that's what we meant when, he, when we say predator. Another common term that you'll hear is parasitoid. So parasitoids, including some families of flies and wasps, lay eggs on or in hosts or host eggs. Um, <coughs> the larval stage of these parasitoid insects grows in or on that host and then eventually kills it and leaves it behind. And the difference between a paras parasite and parasitoid is in the outcome for the host. So, while both actually live in or on an organism, something that we call a parasite only consumes part of the host. So it might weaken the host, but not kill it. Whereas a parasitoid eventually kills its host. And both are part of our weird and wonderful world of insects. One thing to know about parasitoids as opposed to predators, which are quite generalist in most cases, um, Par most parasitoids are specialists, meaning they are, their prey are limited to a very particular insect group or species. They tend to be really host specific and really effective at keeping that host's population in check. So the key element that provides balance in this system is that the parasitoid's own species is dependent on that host. So it's not, it's not to their advantage to completely wipe out the host. Populations of both end up being kept in relative balance. Parasitoid families are incredibly diverse. The Braconid wasp, wasp family has over 15,000 described species. Um, and actually, in many cases, recognizing their damage is often easier than recognizing the insect itself. Braconid wasps are really difficult to identify, but we can see their damage in, for example, aphid mummies or emergence holes and eggs or pupae on caterpillars like these, these cocoons on the tobacco horn, hornworm moth caterpillar. Okay, so I'll introduce one more piece of life history information to set the stage for Miranda, and that is uh, talking about metamorphosis. So life history of different insects is really important for understanding their biology and the complexities of how they interact with different animals and plants. So where they live and what they eat and how they develop are all pieces that help us recognize and support them with less disruptive management uh, practices. So I'm gonna assume most of you are familiar with the concept of metamorphosis. So like a monarch butterfly, for example, goes through egg and caterpillar and chrysalis before becoming an adult. Um, and that beautiful black and orange um, adult that you see flying around. Many other insects go through this, what's called complete metamorphosis, where the egg and larva and a pupa and adult all look quite different. Um, so examples of uh, insects that undergo complete metamorphosis include beetles, bees, butterflies, flies, wasps. Um, so what this means is that you have to be able to recognize them at their different life stages. So learning to recognize and conserve them involves learning different forms, 
different diets and different habitat needs for different stages of their life cycle. Other insects can be a little easier. So the nymphs, nymphs or the immature insects can be uh, basically resemble smaller versions of the adult. Um, so these incomplete metamorphosis or gradual metamorphosis insects do have an egg stage and a nymphal stage, but then they don't have that pupil stage where they're undergoing the complete change from immature to adult. Nymphs of these kinds of species often have a thinner exoskeleton than the adults, and they also lack wings. Um, so examples of that include ambush bugs, minute pirate bugs, earwigs, praying mantises. So Miranda will talk more about different insects that exhibit incomplete or complete metamorphosis. Um, but that just goes to show there is a lot of diversity in these different insects and their life histories. Um, so as we learn more about the biology of different insects, I thought I should first kind of give you a framework for how we use that information. So how do we take life history information and then use it to conserve beneficial insects? The big picture is that building and protecting habitat that supports these insects is the key. There's a lot of research that demonstrates that the amount of natural habitat in a landscape directly influences beneficial insect abundance and diversity. So if we're hoping to stem losses of insect diversity and the services they provide, we're gonna to need to take steps at all levels uh, to protect, restore, and enhance habitat for beneficial insects across landscapes both in wild areas, farmland, and in urban cores, and working to connect natural areas that kind of act as these reservoirs of invertebrate diversity can help these animals persist across landscapes. So where the life history information comes in is really at the level of those individual habitats. So what habitat means is food and shelter. Many beneficial insects rely on pollen and nectar at specific periods during their life cycle, or they can use floral resources as an alternative food source um, to supplement diets when their prey isn't available. Planting flowering plants that supply pollen and nectar can help support these insects as well as the insects that they are consuming. So access to diverse habitat can increase reproduction and longevity of a lot of different kinds of beneficial insects. Habitat can also provide important undisturbed habitat for overwintering in insects, as well as locations for egg laying throughout the year. So a brush pile is an example of, of a place that can provide some of these more protected habitat structures. Old hollow stems from previous year's plants can also be important nest making habitat. Um, like for certain nest, uh, nest making wasps, for example. Uh, and Miranda's gonna talk more, I think, about where different insects live and lay their eggs in overwinter. The final piece of habitat is protection from pesticides. So insecticides are designed to kill insects. In many cases, they're quite broad in the range of insects that they affect. And they're not going to distinguish between the pest insect that they're intended to kill and other insects living alongside it. As Rachel, Rachel Carson once wrote, many of the chemicals now used to kill all insects, friends and enemies alike. Not that I would call all pests enemies, but I, I think you understand the message. Insecticides can be acutely toxic to many beneficial insects, as well as cause sublethal effects, which are effects that don't reach the level of killing the insect, but might affect reproduction or behavior or how they move and navigate. So we need to provide insects with healthy habitat free from pesticide contamination. Oops. Sort of the end big picture is wanting to create an environment that's favorable and supports beneficial insects, which includes providing a safe place uh, protected from disturbance, as well as providing the sort of diverse plant habitat that these insects need to survive and reproduce. So the good news is here is that there are ho there's hope for even as we talk about the insect apocalypse, insects are quite resilient. There are established methods in conservation biology and management that can produce really positive outcomes for insect populations over pretty reasonable time scales. So if you're interested in learning more, particularly for farm and garden settings, we have some resources available on our website, which is xerces.org. 
xercs.org on habitat planning and farming with beneficial insects. So those are some, some good resources to check out if you have more interest. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Miranda. I will stop screen scaring. I will. Let me know if this works. <laughs> Start screen sharing. Looks good. Okay, great. Uh, so Emily covered a lot about the background and how we can help beneficial insects. So I'm gonna talk a little more about the ecology of di different beneficial insect groups and give you some ID tips so you can identify what you see outside. Um, so we'll start with some, some of the common beneficial insect groups that we'll see here in New Mexico. And I'm gonna focus more on the natural enemy groups. So those are gonna be organisms that will kill, injure, or reduce the fitness of insect pests. The ecology fitness is referring to the reproductive success of an organism. So while this list isn't um, inclusive of all beneficial insects that we'll find here, these will be some of the more common groups that you'll might see. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about flies. We'll talk about lacewings, wasps, uh, predatory true bugs, and predatory beetles. After each of these, we'll talk a little bit about the metamorphosis, since for complete metamorphosis, as Emily said, the life stages are often gonna have different food sources. Um, and they're also going to often appear visually different from each other. I will go a little bit into their prey um, when they're active here in New Mexico, where they're overwintering, and then, like I said, some ident identification tips. So the first one we're going to talk about are flies, and we'll begin with the robber fly. So robber flies, adults, are active fly flyers, and they are generalists. So they're going to pretty much go after any insect their size that flies by. Um, adults have large legs so that they can grasp that pest and feed on them. The larvae are actually underground, so we don't really see them, uh, but they're, they're eating other uh, insect larvae down there. They are most active here in the summer, and they aren't really the best for pest control because they are those opportunistic predators and they're gonna eat any insects, which can include pollinators and other beneficial insects, and they might even eat each other. Some of the adults, like this one in the upper right, mimic bees, and that's to help them uh, to appear uh, less dangerous to insects as they pass by. And they can be tricky to tell apart sometimes when you're outside watching them. Um, so they are gonna overwinter as larva underground. A few key ID tips for identifying those robber flies. Since they're flies, they're gonna have a single pair of wings, which is kind of hard to see in this picture, um, but they usually kind of lay their wings on top of one another over their abdomen when they're resting. They also have that long tapering abdomen, which is gonna really set them apart from the other insects. They have long legs that they use to grasp their prey. In this case, it was a bee that got um, picked up by this robber fly. They also have very large eyes and uh, they have a bearded face that have fine hairs covering their mouth parts. So that's really obvious in this photo. Um, so if you can get an up close picture of a robber fly, you can really see that those hairs over their mouth parts. Our next set of flies are actually one of the two parasitoid groups that we'll talk today. So they're tachinid flies. As flies, they also undergo complete metamorphosis. With tachinid flies, the females are gonna lay their eggs on or near their insect host, and the larva stage is a, a parasite. So that larva is gonna develop inside of their host, which is eventually gonna result in their death. Um, some tachinid fly species are generalists, meaning they attack a wide variety of hosts, while others are specialists. But hosts are most often going to be alapidopterans, so the caterpillar stage of butterflies and moths. And they also only attack the larval stage of their host. 
And these two pictures here on the right just show tachinid fly larvae that's come out of on the top of the uh, monarch caterpillar. So this caterpillar was setting itself up to pupate. Unfortunately, it had been parasitized by tachinid flies, so those came out instead. So if you see a dead caterpillar hanging or a chrysalis that has a kind of a slimy string coming out of it, that means that a tachinid fly has emerged because they'll, they'll use that slimy string to kind of slither down until they can get closer to the ground where they drop and pupate. These are some of the adult tachinid flies that we'll find around here. A lot of times they'll resemble house flies, but other times they look uh, quite distinct, like this uh, red one, which I saw up in the uh, forest outside of Santa Fe. Um, but all of these tachinid flies are gonna have more stout bristly hairs on their abdomen. So these flies can undergo, oh, sorry. <laughs> these flies can undergo multiple generations per year but they're generally going to overwinter as a larva or as a pupa, either within their host or as a pupa in the leaf litter. And some will also pupate within the pupa of their host to overwinter. It can get confusing until you see what comes out. The next fly group are surface flies, which are also known as hover flies or flower flies. Again, as a fly, it goes through complete metamorphosis. But with surface flies, only the larva stage is predaceous. So this is a picture here on the right of a larva eating an aphid. So you can kind of see how small it is. But these larvae are often not noticed because they're slow moving and they really blend into the plants. But they will leave behind a smear on the leaf after eating. So these uh, larva stage are great predators of some soft bodied insects like aphids, scales, spider mites and thrips. And then you'll see the adults visiting flowers because they feed on pollen and nectar. So surface flies are gonna be active from the spring through the fall. And oftentimes they're one of the most, or the first insects that I see um, in early spring around here. Uh, surface flies will actually overwinter as either a larva, a pupa, or an adult in leaf litter or in the soil. These are two examples of what the adult looks like. So surface fly adults can, uh, some of them do kind of mimic bees. And this first tip is gonna be hard to see without taking a picture or using insect binoculars when you're viewing the insects. And it takes some practice with spotting. But the first thing that distinguishes surface flies is that they have this serious vein on the wing. And that is just a thickened part that appears similar to a vein and it kind of fades out on the leaf. They also have uh, two wings being flies that have an iridescent sheen to them. As flies, they also have large eyes and they have really short and stubby antenna. And they're also called hover flies because of their flight patterns. They can be seen kind of hovering around flowers, checking them out. Because a lot of our flies mimic bees, I thought we'd go into a comparison on how visual differences between bees and flies. So as you can see on the left here, bees have eyes on the side of their head, whereas on the right, flies have large eyes that often touch on the top. While both may be hairy, bees have branched hairs for pollen collection, and the flies are generally not hairy. They are pollinators, so you may see uh, pollen on them, but not in the same um, distinct places as the bee has. Also, bees often have long and slender antenna to them, while flies have short, stubby antenna. And then this one is usually harder for me to see personally, but bees have four wings, so they have two sets of wings, while flies only have one set of wings, so they only have two wings. Our next group are the lace wings. So these ones will also go through a complete metamorphosis and the immature stage, which can be seen here on the bottom right, is a predator, while the adult um, on the left here, uh, kind of hard to see in that leaf, is also is a predator, but it will also feed on nectar, pollen, and honeydew. So both of these stages do eat a lot of soft-bodied insects. The larval stage is also known as an aphid lion, and they are small, so they're kind of rare to come across 
And you also won't see the adults very much because they're more active at night when the temperatures are cooler. Um, what I see mostly are the, are the lacewing eggs. So in the upper right here is a picture of a lacewing egg. They are on a stalk and they may be laid singly as in this picture or in groups. And they're also laid near prey most of the time. And an uh, interesting fact I found is that the lacewing lays its egg on a stalk so that the first one that hatches doesn't eat the other eggs. Um, so that's kind of a behavior they have adapted. Uh, these um, adults may disperse too if flowering plants are not present. But they will overwinter in leaf litter or within cocoons attached to leaves. Here's an, a clearer picture of an adult. And this is a green lacewing, but brown lacewings are also around. So common traits to lacewings are that their wings fold roof-like over their abdomen, as you can see here. They have long wings that look lacy, hence, lacy, hence the name lacewing, and kind of hidden by that leaf, but they have bulging eyes on their faces. So you might not see them, but they're most likely around. Some of our predatory true bugs include the assassin and ambush bugs. So these are, as true bugs, go through incomplete metamorphosis, so the immature and adult stages are both predators. They are generalist predators, so they will eat both pest and beneficial insects. And I learned that they actually rarely become very abundant in our landscapes because they have many natural enemies of their own, including themselves. So they might also eat themselves. This one on the left here is an ambush bug, and those will be found more commonly on flowers later in the year. And they have this pattering and coloration so that they kind of blend into the flower so that they can ambush the, their insect prey. So these true bugs will overwinter either as eggs, nymphs, or adults at the base of plants under leaf litter or behind tree bark, and we're likely to see them in the summer. You may also find their eggs laid on leaves or branches of plants. Some tips for identifying these assassin bugs are that they have this uh, bottle-like head that has a distinct neck region and they also as true bugs have this piercing sucking mouth part that they use. Uh, this is why they're called assassin bugs because they use that mouth part to stab their prey and then they kind of suck the juices out of them. So that they can be good eating pests like this uh, milkweed stem weevil, but they will also eat beneficial insects like this one on the left that we found that had a bee as its prey. Minute pirate bugs are another true bug, and they're actually the smallest of the predatory true bugs that are found in yards and gardens. So these uh, minute pirate bugs you'll often see on flowers because the adults will also feed on pollen and nectar. Their prey is also those small soft, soft bodied insects, um, so thrips and insect eggs and things like that. They're active from the late spring to the early summer and their primary habitat is actually gonna be leaf litter, herbaceous vegetation and trees. And this is in this picture with this uh, minute pirate bug here, that is on a lance leaf coreopsis. So if you can picture what that flower looks like, that's how small that that bug is. So they're about two to three millimeters long. So they can be very difficult to spot. Um, unless I have had that, they will bite you. So you might see them on your arm if you feel, feel a little pinch while you're out looking at plants. Oh, sorry again. <laughs> I'm going the wrong way now. Okay. And they will actually overwinter in leaf litter. I don't know if I said that, I'm sorry. Uh, some key ID traits for our, uh, my new pirate bug, besides being quite tiny, they if you can happen to see them, they have a cone-shaped head. They have these uh, wings that form a black and white X, and they also have bulging eyes. So then we'll discuss some of our predatory beetles. So the most common one is gonna be our lady beetles. So these ones undergo also complete metamorphosis. So the larva stage, which is shown on the top here, looks 
very different from the adult stage on the bottom, but the larvae are great predators, but they can also be mistaken as pests with um, how different they look. And they look like other beetle larvae, some of which are actually pests. Whereas the ad adults are predators, but they may also be found feeding on pollen, nectar, and honeydew. Lady beetles have a variety of prey, mostly soft, small, soft, soft-bodied insects like aphids, scale insects, mites, thrips, and insect eggs. And they're gonna be active in the spring through the fall. You also may come across adults uh, overwintering in leaf litter, in rock crevices, behind bark, or even in, in your house. Uh, these are just uh, some of the common ladybug species that we'll see here in New Mexico, and many of these are going to feed on aphids. So first on the upper left here, we have the two-spotted lady beetle. Easy to ID because it has two spots on its abdomen. On the bottom left here, we have the parentheses lady beetle, which has a parentheses or two commas on its lower abdomen. We also see on the upper, or in the middle, upper middle one here, convergent lady beetles. And these are one of the most common ones that seem to be around this area. And they're also gonna be the ones most used in gardens to control aphids. I've also had people share pictures with me of large aggregates of them outside. The twice stabbed lady beetle on the bottom center here is named so because it's black has a black body and has two red spots on its back. And the twice stabbed lady beetles are actually going to feed on scales on trees and shrubs. And then these last two species are actually introduced. So the one on the upper right is the seven spotted lady beetle, which has seven spots on its back. And the one on the bottom right is the multicolored lady beetle, which is the Harmonia genus. Uh, they will have, spotting can vary on it, um, so I learned my lady beetles at Minnesota, University of Minnesota, so we say they have an upside down, an upside down M on their head, which may also look like a W if you're looking at it the right way. You may also find eggs um, laying near pests, so this top picture is kind of a blurry picture, but I had aphids on my desert willow out front, and then I found these ladybug eggs that were laid nearby. So ladybug eggs are going to be laid in clusters like this picture shows, and they are yellow oranges color, and they often have a cylindrical shape to them, and they're also usually uh, laid near their food source. And the larva, as I said, looks very different. It has six legs, its body is elongated, and it doesn't have wings. And you may also see the pupil form, which is shown in the bottom right here. It attaches to the at base to the leaf, and you might see it moving a little bit if you observe them. Another beetle we have around here is the checkered beetle. So uh, this is another one where we don't really see the larva because they're commonly in tunnels of dead trees. Um, but you might see the adults on flowers because um, they will feed on pollen. So both the larval and the adult stages are pollens and they po are predators and they eat a variety of things like grasshopper eggs, aphids, other small insects, and some will even eat bark beetles and other wood boring beetles. So you'll also commonly see the adults in dead tree trunks or logs because they're searching for food or egg laying sites. And these checkered beetles are going to be active from the spring to the fall. Checkered beetles often have a bright color pattern to them. Some are also a little hairy sometimes. They have a rectangular head and the end of their antenna is clubbed. Another beetle you'll come across is the soft winged flower beetle. So this is another one where the larva lays, it lives in the soil and it's rarely observed, but it's down there eating other immature insect stages. And the adults are predators but they also again feed on pollen and nectar. So this is another beetle that's eating soft-bodied insects and that we'll find in the summer. And members of this, this is the college genus, they're actually considered very important predators of insects in many um, agricultural crops. So this one again has a bright color pattern to it. 
You'll also see that the end of the abdomen here is not covered by wings, which is a key trait of them. And they have this very kind of funky looking antenna where the segments at the base of the antenna are enlarged. So if you happen to see that, you know you have a soft winged flower beetle. So another grouping that gets tricky sometimes are those beetles versus the true bugs. So just keep in mind that beetles have chewing mouth parts to them, whether they're um, eating insect pests, some of them will eat plants as well, they'll have a different feeding pattern than true bugs, which have the piercing sucking mouth parts to them. Beetles have an elytra um, for the second set of wings, so that's just a modified wing that forms a hard protective covering over the wings. So if you think about when you see a ladybug flying, you'll see the, the red kind of lifted and it kind of stays there while they're flying. Whereas uh, the true bugs have this, the bottom has a membranous, membranous wing tip. And then they do undergo different forms of metamorphosis. So beetles are going through complete metamorphosis, whereas true bugs are going through incomplete. So our next natural enemy is gonna be the praying mantis. These ones go through incomplete metamorphosis. So the immature form, which can be seen in this top picture here, uh, resembles the result, re the adults, but it lacks, lacks wings. So praying mantis are another generalist predator. So they are also maybe not the best uh, to control pests because they're gonna eat anything they can get their, their legs on. They're gonna be active in the summer. Um, they're pretty distinct. Um, anyways, but you'll also notice, see that they have a, a triangular head. They have very large eyes on the side of their head, and they have those raptorial front legs that they use to um, capture their prey. So you'll often see them hunting near flowers where they will pretty much, you know, feed on what's there. So this one in the bottom we saw had a surfeit fly. And we also had one living on our sunflowers outside our office and it found all these uh, caterpillars. So we had to decide if we let the praying mantis uh, do what it's supposed to do or try to save those caterpillars. So it's up to you. Praying mantids have one generation per year. And you may also come across the egg case for the praying mantis. So this is how they overwinter and the female will lay this egg case on plant stems or other sturdy object, objects, and they're covered then in a frothy foam that hardens to protect them. So if you do find one, uh, be sure you leave it outside because the egg's hatching time is temperature dependent. So if you were to bring them inside, you might trigger them hatching early. But if you also have a garden and you want to put some praying mantids in there, you could move the egg case to that and then they'll hatch there. Our last group we'll talk about will be the wasps. So first we have the larger predatory wasps. And wasps, we don't see this, but they actually go through complete metamorphosis. So the larvae are predators, while the adults are predators that supplement their diet with nectar. So the females will actually bring insect prey back to their nest in order to feed their young. So here in New Mexico, we have social wasps like yellow jackets and paper wasps, and a lot of solitary wasps as well. And with the solitary wasp, we don't really have to worry about them stinging because they don't really, really do that to people. So wasps are very important predators in biocontrol and they prey on a variety of insects and spiders. We're gonna see them from the spring through the fall. They're nesting in soil cavities or wood. So as you're observing your yard or landscape, you might see them going in and out of the ground or in and out of a concrete block and they overwinter in those nests. Some key ID traits for our wasps are gonna be that they're, they're pretty big. So most of them are gonna be bigger than 10 millimeters. They're generally not hairy. And a lot of them have a long and thin uh, body with a narrow waist. And these pictures are just three examples of three common wasp families that we have here. So this one on the left is a specid wasp, which are the thread-waisted wasp. You can see by its very, very narrow waist. Then we have the vested wasps, which are gonna include our yellow jackets and paper wasps. And then we also have our, our spider wasps. And these ones, special, so for example, the tarantula hog wasp. Um, these ones all specialize in spiders and they will always choose hosts that are larger than the wasp 
And so this is a, a spider that we, or a wasp we saw dragging a spider um, back to its nest or outside. So this spider was incapacitated by the wasp right thing. And this wasp is then going to drag it back to its nest, lay an egg on that spider. And that spider is still immobilized. So when that egg hatches, the larva is going to eat the spider. Just fascinating to bit for you. Bees and wasps are related to each other. So bees have actually evolved from wasps um, to be more specialized instead of sometimes. They can be a little tricky to distinguish from one another. But in general, our bees are going to have shorter stator legs. Our wasps are going to have those long slender legs and wasp legs are going to have spines instead of pollen collecting pairs. Most of our bees are more thick bodied and then wasps or bees like I said evolved to uh, collect pollen so they have branch tears specifically for that purpose whereas some of our wasps are hairy but they don't have those branch tears on them. And then finally we have our small parasitoid wasps. So like the tachinid fly, uh, the larva of these parasitoid wasps are going to be parasites and predators in the host. With the parasitoid wasps, we have two types. So they might be endoparasites, where the larva develop and feed inside of their host, or they might be ectoparasites, which will feed outside of the host. But either way, the larva will eventually end up killing its host. Um, so adults can vary in size, but they will visit flowers for nectar, pollen, and honeydew. And if you watch uh, plants closely, you may, may be lucky enough to see a parasitoid wasp uh, setting itself up to lay eggs in its host. So parasitoid wasps uh, will target a large variety of hosts. They will also uh, attack different life stages. So there are wasps that might target the eggs wasps targeting the larva or nymph stage, even the pupa or, or adults. And these wasps are going to overwinter as a lay egg or larva within their host or as a pupa within, um, they make a cocoon as well, or as adults. These pictures are just some examples of how wasps vary in size here. So these are all wasps that we collected here. In New Mexico, some are going to be very tiny, like this photo in the upper left. That's a penny that's behind it for scale. These other ones are quite small, are also small, um, but not as small as that one on the top. Some are just very distinct looking, like this uh, calcid wasp on the bottom here. And then we also have wasps that have very long ovipositors, like this giant ichneumon wasp on the right here which can be found in coniferous forests here. This photo is actually from uh, the Sandia Mountains. So you might come across those. Because these wasps are so tiny, uh, we're going to often have to look for other evidence of parasitism. So Emily talked about the tomato hornworm and the perconid wasp that parasite, parasitize them. So if you do see a caterpillar covered with cocoons, leave it be so that those parasitoid wasps can complete their life cycle and infect other hornworm caterpillars. Or you can collect it in a container with holes in it and freeze them to see when the wasps come out and then release them. We also have parasitoid wasps that will target insects that form galls. So galls are going to be the abnormal growth on plants. That can be caused for a variety of reasons, but we'll just talk a little bit about the ones caused by insects, so gall wasps all midges, those kinds of things. So in this case, the immature stage is going to produce galls on that plant to make shelter for themselves and to provide food for themselves. And you can find, might see galls on stems, leaves, and other plant parts. But these gall-forming insects are often parasitized by wasps. So the parasit parasitoid wasp will create a much larger exit hole than the gall-forming insects. So if you see large exit holes on your galls, that means that it was likely a wasp that emerged and not your pest. And then we also have um, aphids that get parasitized. So these are oleander aphids on a milkweed plant. And if you see any swollen or abnormal colored aphids among your aphids, that means that there's a parasitoid wasp growing inside them. And these are also called mummies. See them 
And then a few of the other natural enemies that we have around here are going to be things like um, spiders. The spiders, like our other generalist predators, might also consume our beneficial insects, like the spider that's eating a surface fly. We have parasitic nematodes, which are roundworms that need an insect host to complete part of their life cycle. Some will also uh, end up killing their host. We have a lot of insectivores in uh, lizards here in New Mexico. This is just the snake fly, which is another um, predatory insect we have that I think is just kind of cool looking. It kind of looks like a lacewing at first, but it has a longer neck to it and a different head shape. And then we also have a lot of insectivorous birds, which play an important role in pest control. So I also wanted to give you a little update on some of the research we've been doing here on beneficial insects in New Mexico. So the first one is our IPI project where we looked at uh, four different types of green spaces, so flower gardens, natural areas, turf grass parks, and urban agriculture sites, which included small farms and community gardens. So we had students look at sites in Albuquerque, Santa Fe, and Los Alamos, and we also had volunteers around the state doing observations to help us cover a broader area. A lot of um, those people were in Santa Fe, Albuquerque, um, far south as Winston, and as far north as, as Raton. So from this study, um, I just pulled the natural enemies results from it, since that's what we're, our talk is focused on today. So you'll see our four types of green spaces here on the x-axis. The blue lines are ladybugs, orange are surfeit flies, gray are large wasps, and the yellow are small wasps. And we did find that the abundances um, among our natural enemy groups did vary. Um, lady beetles, as you can see here, were highest in urban agriculture sites. Surfid flies uh, were, more, were higher in flower gardens and urban agriculture. Our large wasps were actually highest in the... Um, that down wrong. Um, urban agriculture sites. And then our small wasps were most abundant in flower gardens. So with the variables that we looked at, we looked at a uh, number of uh, flower species blooming, percent cover blooming, and the percent weedy cover. So just looking at the percent blooming because that drove a lot of the differences between our green spaces with the variables that we looked at. We did find that those flower gardens and urban eggs sites had higher percentage of blooming plants, which is likely driving some of that um, abundance of those species. We also have um, native plant plots down at Los Lunas. Where, so we've been using, um, we've been defining native plant as a species that occurs naturally in a geographic area. So we have seven different mixes of six perennial flower species that occur naturally in New Mexico. And each mix was designed to attract native bees and beneficial insect groups. So overall, we've evaluated 22 different flower species and we've been observing who's visiting the flowers. And we've also been doing vacuum samples um, so that we can look at the more of a species level composition. And we will be releasing those uh, results and recommendations later on. But I just wanted to tell you about five of the plants that we had that attracted mostly natural enemies. So the first one was horsetail milkweed, which is pretty common throughout New Mexico. So these distribution maps are from the Biota of North America program. On these maps, the dark green uh, means that the species is present in the state and it's its native range, and the light green is county level data. So it means the species is present and not rare in it. So with the horsetail milkweed, which you are, are probably familiar with, it has uh, white flowers and grows in a variety of areas. We did have over half of our visits were by, were by small wasps and large wasps. So the small wasps are gonna be those parasitoid wasps where the large wasps are more likely of the uh, predatory wasp. So that is a great plant if you wanna attract natural enemies to your landscape. And the second one was another milkweed. So this is the broadleaf milkweed, which is also fairly common throughout the state. With the broadleaf milkweed, over half of the visits were by large wasps, but most, most of those were by tarantula hawk wasps. 
The next one is the Rocky Mountain Penstemon. So of the flower species we had in our study, this was our most visited uh, flower. So with this one, again, over half the visits were by small wasps and lard wasps. We also had a lot of ladybugs on these plants. And this is likely because these penstemon strictus also have extra floral nectaries. So that attracted lady, ladybugs and small wasps to them, even when the plant wasn't flowering. The next one is another penstemon. So it's uh, Palmer's penstemon. Our total visits were lower on this one because we only had it um, in, our, in our plots for one year and the other ones were two years. This one isn't as common um, naturally in New Mexico, but it is used a lot in landscaping. Um, so again, a lot of wasps, more ladybugs, and we also did see bees visiting. And then our final one is the white prairie clover. Um, so white prairie clover is pretty present throughout the southeast, east, or southwest and central part of the U.S. The white prairie clover attracted a very diverse group of large wasps. Um, so if you're wanting to attract predators, this is another, another great one that we have. If you want to learn more about beneficial insects with the resources that NMSU has, we do have several um, extension guides available online for biological control and beneficial insects. Uh, the first one here is our backyard uh, beneficial insect group, which, which ben backyard beneficial insects in New Mexico guide, which is going to offer identification tips and photo examples of pollinator and beneficial insect groups in the state. We also have the guide to biological control of yard and garden insects, which is gonna cover steps to enhance biological control, some of the pests you might encounter and their natural enemies. And then we have a pocket guide to the beneficial insects uh, that has descriptions of beneficial insects and tips on attracting and conserving beneficial insects. And Lastly, I just want to encourage you to observe the, what's going on in the natural world around you because a great way to learn about beneficial insects is to just take the time to observe what's going on. A lot of times you can tell if things are beneficial or not by learning about their behaviors, seeing what they're feeding and eating, and you might just you know, see pests getting eaten or different cool behaviors or just, um, I know the grasshopper is not a natural enemy but you might just see some of the cool colors of insects that are around us. And so if you have a pest or beneficial insect questions, you can always email the NMSU IPM program and even send us photos via email and we're also online. So I'm gonna stop sharing my presentation now. Thank you for your time and patience today. Thanks so much, Miranda. That was awesome. So we have um, a few questions here. I don't know, Caitlin, if you were going to go yeah. through and, and ask those. Definitely. Thank you, too. That was really, really informative. Um, and I don't know if either of you have um, a preference for answering these, but I'll let whoever wants to jump at it. Um, go for it. So one question was um, about moving a brush pile that's like meant for uh, habitat in the backyard. So moving a brush pile and a rock pile um, and they need to move to a different part of the yard and what season is best to do that so you don't disrupt all the critters living in there. And this person's in Las Cruces. So um, I guess what I would say to that is the season that is generally best or that we generally recommend for yard sort of cleanup is um, that late spring when air temperatures start reaching over 60 degrees um, and things start coming out. Um, that's typically when we would recommend that you, you know, cut back old stems on plants to, to open them up for stem nesting bees and that kind of thing. Um, Miranda, I don't know if you have any, any other thoughts on that, but that's what comes to mind for me. No, I was thinking the same thing since you might have a lot of over overwintering insects in there. Great. And um, this is a really good question. Is there a difference between a bug and an insect? <laughs> so that is a really good question. And 
I should say that we have used the word bug in different ways at different times today. So when we called this helpful bugs of northern New Mexico, we were referring to bug as sort of any of the um, like insects and non insects that um, sort of any of the creepy crawlies. So that's typically what, you know, the general public might think of as a bug. And then Miranda was using the term true bug, which is specific within, you know, the insects. Um, so it's specific to an order of insects called hemiptera, which is all the insects that have piercing and sucking mouth parts. So a true bug, if you're going to get really specific about it, is a hemipteran. So that's everything from cicadas to uh, leaf hoppers and tree hoppers and assassin bugs, ambush bugs, all those are hemipterans, aphids, piercing sucking mouth parts. Okay, um, there's a question about roly polies or pill bugs. Um, so someone has a bunch of them in their compost pile and they want to know if they are beneficial to the garden when they spread that compost throughout the season. So roly polies or pill bugs or isopods are, um, they feed on decomposing plant matter. So they are beneficial for sort of nutrient cycling in backyards. Um, so when you spread them out, you're, you know, they're, they're making nutrients available for other plants by sort of breaking down that um, organic matter layer and making sort of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium available. So they are beneficial in that sense. Sometimes if they get too high in populations, they can have some negative impacts that could be pests. I don't know if Miranda, you have any examples or have experienced that, but I think of them generally as beneficial insects in the garden at their normal levels. Now we did have someone that said earlier this year that said they were feeding on their plants, but I'm not sure how much damage it caused. Yeah, generally low levels of damage and better for decomposing. Yeah. I, I also recently read um, that if you have a lot of uh, roly polies, pill bugs in your compost, like in the southwest, that your compost might be a little too dry. So if, if you have like a proliferation of them, um, just a, a note to maybe give it a little more water. Um, okay, next question. Oh, I was also going to mention, I saw a couple people had their hands raised. Um, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box. Um, so the next question, is there a good place to see photos of those different stages of insects in their egg form, larva form, pupa, adult, and when you can find them? Ray, do you want to answer that? Uh, well, I, I, I don't know of any of a comprehensive one that we have online. We do have some of the life stages in that backyard beneficial insects, um, but those are going to be ones that you come across most likely. Um, but there is also that backyard, uh, the insects book from Colorado, right now the name is the backyard bugs maybe. What came to mind? Yeah. But wait, and so it's by Whitney Cranshaw. It's very inexpensive, but it has all of the bugs you might encounter in your garden, both good and bad, and different life stages of it. Awesome. I, the other one that came to mind is if you have a picture that you've taken and you want help IDing it, you can submit it to bugguide.net, which is a great resource. Um, once you have your kind of, you think you might know what it be, might be, you can kind of go in there and click around and find um, related images and taxonomy of different insects. Um, so it's a really great resource and there's experts that are always coming in and vetting new photos that are coming in. So bugguide.net is a great resource for looking at lots of pictures. Great, thanks. Okay, um, Miranda, what are the uh, urban ag sites of the IPIPE? Of the iPad. So we, yeah, so we looked at uh, community gardens in Albuquerque, Santa Fe, and Los Alamos, and then some of the small urban farms um, here in Albuquerque. Okay. Um, I, like, what were the urban ag sites? Were they like farming anything in particular? Oh, or? no, there was a yeah. variety. Of, that way, there was a variety of crops being farmed. On okay. Each of them. 
And someone asked if they can get a copy of this presentation. So this will be available, the raw recording, you'll get an email um, after the webinar today, and that will have a link to the raw recording. And then there will be um, videos posted to NMSU's YouTube channel. And then what is the scientific name of the stink bug? And are they beneficial? And someone said they saw them eating honeybees, so they're not a fan. <laughs> um, so I don't know, I don't know what the stink bug would be named, but the family of stink bugs is Pentatomidae, um, which is kind of because they, well, I think it's because they look a bit like a shield. So shield bugs and stink bugs look quite similar. Um, are they beneficial? They, there are predatory stink bugs that um, can hunt and uh, kill other insects and are, are keeping pest insects in control. Um, but there are also some that can be pests like the brown marmorated stink bug that we have out east that's a pest on uh, a lot of different crops. All right. Um, do you have any advice about how to control ants that are tending aphids in a vegetable garden? <laughs> So I assume they're meaning the ants that are um, that mutualism between uh, ants are kind of protecting the aphids and then but the ants are benefiting from protecting those aphids. Is there anything you can do? I would think you'd want to control the aphid first and then the ants uh, because the ants are also feeding off the honeydew that the mm -hmm. aphids are secreting so um, you could depending on how dense the infestation is, you could spray them with uh, water to knock them off or hand remove them, um, things like that. Yeah, I have a soft glove that I keep for moving aphids off of plants for like soft, the soft squish <laughs> <laughs> if, if water isn't quite enough. Uh, the parasitoid wasp that was dragging the spider away, was that in New Mexico? That was, it was in the, in the Hamas. It was actually just, uh, we saw that three weeks ago. It was, it was oh, cool. Nice. The, the, the spider, uh, the wasp dropped the spider though. So it was a good day for the, the spider. <laughs> um, let's see. Can you cut stems back earlier and just leave them in a pile? Or in other words, does it matter if, for instance, a sunflower stem is standing up still or lying sideways in a brush pile? So yeah, you can, that's, that's often what I will do if I need to um, move things around in the garden and cut stems back is I'll just, I'll cut the stems back and then bundle them up and, or just leave them in a pile sort of in the back of my yard. Um, so anything that's in there could emerge out of that um, instead of like bagging them up and putting them out in sort of the, the bulk trash pick up, um, leave them around and let things come out of them. Uh, and that's a good option. All right. Any predatory insects for scale on pinion pines? Uh, so there are those, those lady beetles. And we also have, um, through NMSU, and IPM strategies for insect pests, insect pests of trees. And we do talk about scale, uh, pinion scales in there. So I, I can look it up, but I recommend Googling that. I don't remember offhand. Great. I'm seeing a lot of comments about how roly polies can be destructive to plant roots. So thank you for pointing that out. I'm going to have yes. to look into that. I've never had that in my own garden, but, um, but that's, that's very good to be aware of. Thanks. Um, someone asked what are really bad insects for gardens beside aphids? Had a lot of aphid talk. What else is there? Um, I mean, in my own garden, I have leaf miners in my spinach, and um, there can be caterpillars of various um, insects that that eat um, your tender vegetables. Or there can be flea beetles. There's lots of different things that yeah. can be present in gardens. I had flea beetles girdle my my peas. This year. Also, um, leaf hoppers we've had at our our study site. Um, 
not only a lot of leaf hoppers, but they transmitted diseases between our, our plants. Mm-hmm. Or you can have things that bore into insect into stems of plants. I had a what I thought was this beautiful clear wing moth show up uh, in my garden last year. Turns out it was a squash vine borer. It's this amazing has these beautiful clear wings and like bright blue and orange. I was like, this is an amazing bug. And I looked it up, and of course it was a squash <laughs> vine borer, and it bored right into my squash. <laughs> like I said, also, we also have a lot of squash bug issues here. Uh, grasshoppers can be bad some years. There's not as much. We have a good amount of pests. <laughs> and also a good amount of other, beneficial insects. Other than the <laughs> um, Can you recommend any sources for how to build a better uh, habitat-friendly environment in the backyard? Yeah, so I would, I would recommend that you look up the Habitat Planning for Beneficial Insects guide that we have on our website. Um, that one is relevant both for farms and for backyard settings, just for like general principles. A lot of the general principles I talked about today, they go into in a little bit more detail in that guide. Great. Let's see. Um, a friend found several dead bees on his milkweed. Could that be a potential pesticide impact from a neighbor's yard? It could be. Um, one, one interesting thing about milkweed is that they are, um, they deliver their pollen in these little packets called pollinia, which um, can be really difficult for smaller bodied bees to pull out of the plant. So like bumblebees, honeybees, carpenter bees are quite strong and they can pull, pull away from the plant. Um, but if you look up milkweed pollinia, you can see they have these like little grabby hooks on this almost on the pollen and the pollen's really big. So bees can kind of get stuck on the plant. Um, so that can sometimes happen where you have a bee that's actually just kind of starved because it's it's been stuck on the milkweed plant by the milkweed pollen. So that could also be what's happening there. Great. Do you know of any bugs, insects that can deter snails? Hmm. I actually read recently that in Albuquerque, a lot of folks keep box turtles in their yards, which will eat snails. So I don't, have you heard of that, Miranda? I've, I've seen a lot of notices on Nextdoor about box turtles, but I didn't know why everyone had them in their yard. So that makes more sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to address one comment that I see here, which was about the introduction of ladybugs to control aphids. Um, and that was, that was what I meant. Um, so it says that the introduction of ladybugs to control aphids was not a viable controls method because research showed that the ladybugs leave, which is entirely true. When you put mass reared ladybug adults into your yard, they just tend to leave. So they're not a great solution for backyard gardening. They can be useful in greenhouse settings where they are not, you know, they're contained and they can't leave. Um, But in general, the sort of mass root insects release into the yard, um, they tend to disperse really quickly and probably won't stick around too long to take care of your aphids. Great. Um, What bug is likely to leave trails on leaves? Like the little... um, like maybe leaf miners? Leaf miners might do that. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, be, um, of insects that sort of work their way through the center of a leaf, um, including leaf miners. So that might be what you find. And I actually had pretty good success with my spinach leaf miners, which initially looked really destructive just by pulling off all of the leaves that were infested. So just like you would on a farm with sort of sanitation practices, taking infested plant materials, removing them from your garden, and then letting the sort of healthy plant materials remain behind. Okay, there was a question, let me find it. Um, Miranda, can you comment on how Ashley Bennett's worked on insectary plants for protection of crops? And, or can you just speak to Ashley Bennett's work? Oh, yeah. So I, I worked with, I worked with uh, Dr. Bennett before she left, and that will be those native plant plots uh, she set up. So we are, we've continued that work. Um, I, I would think that's what they're talking about with the insectary. She did update 
the insectary plant, there's an extension guide on using insectary plants, which uh, has some annual plants that test grass with had uh, started. So uh, that's also available online. So we're still working on it. We're just uh, writing uh, with, with Dr. Skidmore, our new IPM specialist. We're analyzing all of the results and working on getting that written up so that we can share it with, with the state. And I said, there's, I'm seeing there's a lot of questions coming in um, and we may not be able to get to all of them. We have only have a couple minutes left, um, but we, the last webinar in this series, again, is going to be a round table where we try and answer some of the questions that have come up over the series that we haven't been able to get to. Um, and if you have lingering questions that are coming up for you, please email nmsuipm at nmsu.edu and we will try to address as many of them as we can in that last webinar, which is at the end of July. Yeah, and I think we'll be compiling questions that we didn't get answered um, to answer at that very final webinar. Um, lots of confirmations that box turtles do eat snails. Um, <laughs> But raccoons love box turtles, so <laughs> be careful. Don't get your box turtles eaten. Um, someone asked, what do you think about waiting to plant squash until July 1st to reduce those squash bug problems? I guess that kind of depends oh, where you I, are. In New yeah, I know, that's, I know that's a practice that occurs here as planting later, so it's hopefully after the squash bugs are active. Um, I haven't dealt much with squash bugs myself, so. <laughs> yeah, I can't speak to that one, but delayed planting is a pretty common way to address some of the pest problems that you, you get with those, um, with squash. So I'd have to look it up. Yeah, um, so I'm not sure what this stands for. Is NOLA a good way to eliminate grasshoppers? Uh, so that's the NOLA bait. It's a, a fungus, it's a form of biological control. And I think it's not as effective here in New Mexico because it's so hot, hot and dry. Okay, and is there anything else you would recommend for grasshoppers? Um, I know some people plant trap crops for grasshoppers. I've had some uh, master gardeners give me some tricks for trap cropping and putting molasses on things. I'd have to ask them so that the grasshoppers stick, stick to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a question about hornets. Are they the same as wasp? Do they parasitize anything? Are they um, beneficial insects? Yeah, hornets. So <laughs> hornets are predatory. Um, and Miranda, feel free to follow up on this. But um, so hornets and wasps are all related. They're all part of the same um, uh, not family, they're all in Hymenoptera and they're all very related. Um, and they are all, um, so the hornets are, are predatory. Um, so I don't know what else to add to that really. <laughs> they can be beneficial. They can be beneficial, but I know there's also in, uh, issues with yellow jackets and honeybees. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that case, they would be, be more of a pest. Right, yeah, I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah, another question about NOLO bait, if it will hurt beneficials, but I guess if it doesn't oh, it, really well, work it won't, it won't hurt beneficials because it's a fungus that only affects the, the grasshoppers. Okay. Great. Um, so, let's see, there's a question about um, they, someone has plants being negatively impacted by unknown insects. The plants are pale, the leaves have tunnels on them, and their growth is inhibited. And they ask, should I use a crop approved spray or is there some other natural way of uh, treating vegetable plants? So that's kind of hard to tell without knowing exactly what the pest is. So if you want to send us pictures of what your plant looks like and if you can find the but you think might be eating it, you can either send samples um, to us or pictures of that pest, and then we can give you a better recommendation for exactly what you're experiencing. Great. Yeah, 
in general with managing things in your in your backyard garden or on your farm it's really important to have a good id on what's actually causing the damage before you go in and treat um because sometimes there are ways that you can make cultural management adjustments to the way that you're you're doing it by either planting your squash later or by hand removing leaves and and those kinds of things so yeah definitely get in touch with miranda Okay, I'll ask one question. Um, one last one. What are some of the bait plants for grasshoppers that you mentioned? I don't know those off the top of my head. No. I'd have to, yeah, why don't you email us? We can, we can, we can look around. Okay. <laughs> so great. thanks. Yeah, thanks everyone for all these great yeah. questions. And I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions. Please do email if, you, um, if we didn't get to you and, and you'd like an answer to your question. Yes. Yeah, it's 4.30 and this will um, be available as a raw recording and then eventually made into uh, YouTube videos that will be uploaded to New Mexico State University's uh, YouTube channel. And we will try and answer your questions in the final Q&A uh, roundtable um, webinar and yeah, join us next week for um, pollinator habitat and backyards. And uh, if you guys have anything else to add, Miranda and Emily, thank you guys for all of your expertise on beneficial insects. I learned a lot. <laughs> awesome, thank you. There will be a feedback form that pops up um, as you leave the webinar. So if you have time, please give us some feedback. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.